There's a special kind of pride That you feel deep down inside A strength that seems to thrive In Lima Island County The American way of life To get in gear and do what's right An unbreakable forthright link Called Real American Strength Lima Island County Real American Strength Creativity meets technology where possibilities never end. Ohio strong and Western know-how, exploring innovative ideas. Deep rooted but always growing, ever proud of where we live. Lima Allen County, real American strength. Keeping you up to date with what's happening in your community. Community Focus on GTV2. Thanks for joining us today on Community Focus. I'm Ann Decker. I'm pleased to welcome to the studio today Elizabeth Brown. She is with the Lima Symphony Orchestra, and she is here to tell us about a wonderful season that yes. has just begun. Exactly. And we missed the first one already. We missed the first concert, which was absolutely spectacular. We yeah. had a Russian pianist who was incredible, but we had lots of good surprises left for the rest of the season. Well, like what? Well, our next concert is November 10th, and we have a, a trumpet player who's coming. He is coming back from England to be with us. He is a student at the University of Cambridge, where he's doing a Churchill Fellowship in Astrophysics. And so he is just an amazing young 23-year-old kid who is combining science and music and using all parts of his brain. And he's just a dynamo. And he's playing this big, spectacular trumpet piece, which you know, we don't normally get trumpet soloists. We have violin soloists and piano soloists who are wonderful. But to hear someone play something that bold is going to be really, really fun. And what is he playing? He's playing an Arotunian trumpet concerto. I'm not familiar with that. It's a Russian piece. Um, mm -hmm. It's very soulful. It's based on Russian folk melodies. And so it's... Um, it's very dynamic. It's going to be really neat. It sounds like it. It is. And what's the date for that concert? That's November 10th. Okay, so that's coming right coming up. Coming soon. Okay, mm -hmm. we need to be getting mm -hmm. tickets that's now right. if we exactly. want to go. <laughs> exactly. What else is on the program for that night? That night we're also doing a Brahms piece, a Brahms Symphony Number no. 2, which is um, not very often performed. And it's just, people I tend to think Brahms is kind of a little bit moody. Uh, this is just sunny and joyful and of so much fun. So it's going to be a night where you just leave feeling incredibly uplifted and inspired. You usually do after you leave the symphony. Exactly. Exactly. It's fun to hear music played at that level and you know to go to a live performance where things are just done so incredibly well and that's one of the things that you know we always try to try to bring and our musicians are incredible and we're just it'll be it'll be fun. I'm no sure doubt. it will be. No doubt. Does that bring us up to the holiday concert then? That brings then? us to Bells, Brass and Bows which is the second week of second Saturday in December and this year, as always, the choir, the chorus will be joining us. Um, they add such a richness and a depth with their beautiful voices, and so that's a great traditional holiday concert. Um, this year, we're doing three selections from Handel's Messiah, which we haven't done in a long time, and people love the Messiah. Yeah, it's a crowd so pleaser. It definitely is. So I'm really excited about that. And then we have another treat planned for New Year's Eve. We are celebrating some of America's, I think, most. Um, famous, joyful holiday, or not holiday, um, just classical music, and we're celebrating the Boston Pops tradition. And so we're doing a tribute to Arthur Fiedler and the Boston Pops on New Year's, which should be very fun. That sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. It will be. <laughs> and then coming up for 2013, what mm -hmm. do you have lined up? 2013, we start with, um, instead of Mozart by Candlelight this year, which we're branching out a little bit, we're doing Baroque by Candlelight. And we have, I think, the best best music you could possibly imagine of the Baroque era. We are doing everything that people know and love, starting with the theme to Masterpiece Theater. Uh, we're doing Handel's Water Music, a piece from the Brandenburg Concertos. We're just, it's just, it's going to be one of those concerts that if you can only get to one this year, go to the go to the Baroque because we're going to be in Delphus in Ottaville, which is a new location for us, and at Trinity United Methodist Church in Lima. And so there's no excuse. You can find no, us somewhere in all three beautiful, <laughs> wonderful locations. If you can get a ticket, I would imagine, if you're playing that music, it might be That's sold true. out. It will, um, it will sell quickly, so people should definitely think about getting their tickets now. Great. Mm -hmm. And following the Baroque by Candlelight? Following that, we have violinist Pip Clark, who was with us several years ago. She's coming back. Um, she's going to be performing a... Um, 
wonderful piece in February, and just it's going to be a romantic, lush, beautiful, beautiful concert. We're also doing Beethoven's Fourth that night, which is just sunny and happy, and it kind of you know people hear about the fifth of Beethoven and the ninth and you know, the odd numbers, and we're doing the fourth, which is a little again less played, but really, really neat. It's a treasure, mm -hmm. so that should be great. Family concert is going to be one of those. Who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> um, we're doing Sim Fantasy. And we have a program with jugglers and acrobats and unicyclists, and it's just going to be, it really is going to be a fantasy. It's perfect for kids because there will be so much activity and movement and joy on that. And what a great way to introduce them to the oh, symphony. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and tickets for that are only $10 a person, and so it really is a very affordable, wonderful program for kids, for families alike. Um, you know, it's, it's neat to see kids go with their grandparents, with, you know, little sisters and big brothers and, and everybody there together and smiling and having such a great time. It is a great time. And you know, mm -hmm. for those adults who maybe aren't familiar with the symphony, what a great way to introduce them as well. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's also a lot of, I mean, it's just fun and fast paced. And so it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a wonderful introduction for any age, no doubt about it. And following the family concert? Following the family concert, we close our concert in April and we have a piece that we have been wanting to do forever and ever. And um, finally, it's going to actually happen this year. We are doing Carmina Burana. Oh, wow. Which is, yeah, exactly, it, exactly. It's just, it's a beautiful, old choral piece. Um, the voices are so, so important. And that's been a limitation for us is that, you know, we have to pair with the Bowling Green um, University Choral Society and, of course, our chorus. When we usually do pair with them for the April concert, mm -hmm. but we finally got it so that, you know, everybody is available on the same night. We have enough voices up on stage, and the stage is going to be packed with, you know, hundreds of vocalists and musicians, and it's just going to be a great way to end the season. Well, it does sound like a great season. Mm -hmm. If people are interested in tickets, can they get them individually? Can they get them as season tickets? How Absolutely. does it work? Um, season tickets are still available, and we also have individual tickets for every concert on sale now, so people can get them online. We've added, we've expanded our online capability. We've been selling tickets online for a while, but it has, we had some software issues. And so finally, I think we really got it down and it's working the way it's supposed to be working. And they can call, or they can call the office, come by the office, whatever works best for them. Okay. Your phone number is? 222-5701. And the website is? www.limasymphony.com. Okay. I do need to ask you about Kraft and Beck. Mm -hmm. um, we're still up in the air as to whether he's going to return next year. Yeah. We are unfortunately still up in the air um, in the office as well. This, this is a board matter, not a staff matter, and we really don't know any more than the community knows. Um, the board is meeting in a couple of weeks, and we all hope for resolution then. Okay, so hopefully by Thanksgiving we'll know whether Crafton stays or goes. So. Yes, yes, I think we should know then. Okay. Thanks so. for coming in today, Thank Elizabeth. You. Thank You're you. welcome. Elizabeth Brown from the Lima Symphony. When we come back, we'll talk Lima City budget with Steve Cleves right after this on GTV2. Help keep the youth of Lima safe by donating to Lima Safety City today. Hello, I'm Chuck Eichelberger from the Lima Noon Optimist Club. Safety City is a very important part of the Lima community. The Optimist Club is renovating Safety City and it needs your help. Donations can be made by going to the website limasafetycity.org. You can also send a donation to Lima Noon Optimist Club, P.O. Box 428, Lima, Ohio 45802. Help keep the youth of Lima safe by donating to Safety City today. My joints ached and I was always tired. I was always cold, I couldn't concentrate, and my body hurt all over. My doctor told me I had lupus. Women of childbearing age, and especially African American women, are at higher risk. If you suspect that you have lupus, you should contact your doctor. You're invited to attend the local lupus support group meetings on the second Thursday of each month at 1 o'clock at Lima Towers. For further information, go to connectedhands.org. Lima City Council has recently amended the city's vicious dog warnings to deal with potential problems concerning dangerous dogs in the public. The ordinance is comprehensive. However, here are some key elements that all dog owners and their neighbors should be aware of. Any dog that is considered a breed of pit bull is considered a vicious dog regardless of its temperament. A vicious dog is any dog that attacks, bites, or causes injury to a person or domestic animal with or without provocation. Not under control of the owner, and secure with a muzzle and a leash of six feet or less in length. All vicious dogs must be confined when outside in a pen with a secured top and bottom or with the sides of the pen embedded at least one foot deep into the ground. If you're a dog owner and have concerns about any dogs in your neighborhood, visit LimaPoliceDepartment.com to find out more about the city's vicious dog ordinance. The fine for non-compliance is $150 per citation and ignorance of the law is not a defense. If there's an emergency situation, call local law enforcement for immediate assistance. This is nice.
nice neighborhood. It is. Is that the house we were living in, Mom? Yes. Look at all the kids around here, Mom. I like this house. Hi, right, we're here about the house. It's rented. It's against the law to deny people the opportunity to live where they want and can afford. If you feel that you've been treated unfairly, give LACA a call and we'll look into your complaint. LACA's Fair Housing Services are free, so call today and get the housing you deserve. 419-227-2586. We're back on Community Focus. I'm Ann Decker. The City of Lima is busily putting together the 2013 budget and wrapping up its 2012 budget. Here in the studio to give us a preview of what's coming up is Steve Cleves, the Finance Director. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here, eh? How is 2012 shaping up as we wrap up the year? Is it where you expected it to be? Well, we've had uh, two reviews uh, this year uh, of our, our 2012 budget, and uh, through the, uh, the middle of the year, uh, we were on target to have a balanced budget, and I'm pleased to say that through September, uh, that, is, uh, that is the case also. Actually, our uh, revenues are, uh, are picking up some. There's a, an exhibit here of our uh, estimated uh, revenues for uh, 2012, and the large uh, salmon piece of this pie chart at the bottom is our income tax, and uh, that's about 60% of our revenues. And in this year, uh, we've, we've had, uh, uh, in the prior year, a, an, an uptick in the net profits tax of our businesses. And this year, the net profit taxes are up very substantially. They're up 17%. Uh, now, that, that's a small slice of the overall uh, tax uh, revenues of just under uh, 16 million. But uh, that does indicate that the businesses are making profits. Uh, they're, they're hiring uh, and their salary structure as reflected in our withholding portion, which is a really big chunk. Those are all the employees who are paying city taxes are only up about 3%. So there's, there's always a lag uh, between the time uh, a business uh, starts to make money coming out of a recession and when they feel uh, comfortable enough to start hiring. But that process has started uh, and I'm, I'm fairly confident that in the coming uh, year uh, that net profits increase of 17% will be, be followed by a much uh, higher increase in the withholding taxes uh, than the 3%. Uh, so you're planning that into the 2013 budget? Yes, I will. Uh, we, we will, well, we're going to be uh, a conservative because we do have this, this fiscal cliff uh, facing us where we could go into a second dip. But uh, uh, we'll probably estimate uh, a 3% increase in our income taxes well, for 2013. How do you even plan then? If it looks like it's going up, but maybe there's the cliff out there, that's got to make your job difficult. Well, we just keep an eye on it. And uh, we'll do uh, a really extensive uh, review in the middle of the year. You know, I look at the numbers every month, but uh, you need several months in a row, and you have to follow the, uh, the national and regional economies to see what's going on. And if, uh, if our estimates in the middle of 2013 uh, uh, appear to be on track as to where I think they're going to go. We'll have a, uh, a budget review for some additional capital purchases as we did this year. This year uh, we went out and, and purchased uh, about a million of $300,000 worth of general fund uh, capital equipment uh, in the fire department and streets department and the police department. and. Uh, I think we'll be able to, to go out and uh, make s uh, some additional purchases in uh, 2013. We, we also refinanced a bond th this year, which was much larger in the utilities area. It was uh, close to $3 million uh, uh, in, in total. And by doing that refinancing with the interest rates as low as they are, uh, we saved the city about, about $300,000 in uh, payments over the, over the term of the uh, loans. So that, those rates are so low, uh, uh, I, I, th I think we got our, our bond for just, uh, just under 3%. And uh, some of the items are uh, 20 years. And the average inflation over a 20-year period is, is generally above a 3%, might be 35 to 4 somewhere there. 
at least three. So in, in effect, there's really it's almost an interest-free loan when you, when you look at the term uh, of, of those paybacks uh, going forward. So we took advantage of that uh, this year, and we'll probably do that again next year. How big is the city's general fund budget? Well, on the next exhibit, there's a, a, there's a pie chart which shows the breakdown of our expenditures. Uh, our uh, expenditures this year and, and our revenues are, are, are going to be in the $27 million range. And next year, uh, they'll probably be about $28.5. Uh, you know, I, I don't have the uh, submissions yet from the uh, uh, various uh, administrators in, in the city, but we have, we have labor inflation we have, you know, uh, and health care inflation, uh, which have been restrained uh, quite well, actually, in, in uh, recent years. Uh, uh, we've had successful talks with the unions, and they've, been, uh, uh, they've talked to us in good faith, and we've had uh, good settlements. Uh, we've managed to keep the city solvent, actually improve our, our financial rating and uh, keep our cost uh, level and uh, we haven't had to lay anybody off or furlough anyone. And I think that danger is, is over with now. Will the increased labor and health care costs eat up the extra money that you're projecting or is there going to be a little extra money for additional services? Well, I, I, I'm going to submit a balanced budget. You know, well, you maybe have to, it, don't you? There, well, we have a cash balance. You know, the way the state d defines the balance budget is your your uh, resources are not exceeded by your spending. I mean, that's the way the government does it. It's a bit strange, but that's the way they do it. So uh, a lot of people say they have a balanced budget, but they actually have a negative. Their revenues are less than their uh, expenses, uh, so they draw down their cash balance. Uh, I think that's basically what's happened up north in uh, Findlay with their situation over the past years. But um, uh, we will submit a balanced budget and I, I think I'll show a, a, uh, a slight surplus and I hope it's going to be larger than that. But we'll see uh, at, at mid-year uh, what kind of shape we're going to be in. It, what do you need to buy for the city if the money is there? Well, we need more equipment for the police department. Uh, in the fire department, they have engines that are in need of uh, replacement. Uh, we have uh, uh, some, uh, some new software which is going to be installed uh, for the uh, safety services area. And that new software takes uh, sort of like a laptop computer, uh, a tablet thing. So when the, uh, the officers and the firemen are in the field, they can uh, write down the information uh, as they're there. It, it helps their reporting systems and their communications, uh, record keeping and uh, all, the, all the rest of it. You know, I, I think on that pie chart, you know, uh, the, the point is on, on the labor, it's, it is 80 percent of our cost. You know, all of those slices on that pie chart basically except the, uh, the kind of a light blue one uh, uh, are labor. You have the salaries in the dark blue and the red and the yellow slice are fringes in health care. So, I mean, that swallows up 80% of our cost. And, and that's why we have to, we've constrained manpower so closely over the past 10, 15 years. Uh, on this final exhibit, you'll see a, a bar chart, and you can see uh, how much that manpower has been reduced. O over the last 10 years, it's down about 20%. And over the last 15 years, it's down almost to 40 percent. But we've reached a level now that we can sustain. And uh, I think going forward, uh, we're going to be in, uh, in decent shape. Will we be able to bring back some of that manpower that we lost? Or are we simply at a point where we don't need them back? Well, we have a number of uh, temporary employees uh, on our payroll. That's one way we uh, re restrain costs. We're, we are saving over $2 million, word, uh, $2 million a year uh, due to the attempts that we hire. And we're going to start to fill those slots with permanent employees slowly as we go forward. Well, why if the temps are saving us money? Well, there are certain, those temps don't stay very long. That's why they're called temps. And, 
and you need a uh, you need a history and a background in a lot of those jobs. You know, experience counts, and uh, as you learn more, you you're there longer. You can learn even more, and your and your performance increases. Uh, so we, you know, in some of those uh, jobs, as a matter of fact, in most of them, we, we would like to put uh, permanent employees back in there so we know that they're going to be in here for the long haul. They have a whole different attitude, you know. A temporary em employee is glad to have that job, especially in a down economy. When the economy turns around, like it is now in Lima, and uh, there are jobs opening up, those temps will go someplace where they can make uh, more money and have additional benefits. And so, you have to start all over. And we have to start all over again. So there is a real benefit in having, having permanent employees when you can afford them. But you know, during this, uh, this uh, crash we had in, in 2008, we had to be very careful. We didn't want to lay anybody off. So we uh, replaced the uh, needed attrition replacements with temps whenever we could. Okay. We've actually increased manpower in, area, in the fire department, for example, and we've increased manpower in the police department. Now everywhere else they've been cut. Uh, um, uh, very substantially, uh, actually, and uh, and some of those cuts are deeper than we, than I'm comfortable with, and I think the entire administration is comfortable with. You you need a certain amount of expertise in in these jobs, uh, and you know you if you cut too many people who are essential in managing your business, then you're uh, your performance of the whole organization drops. So uh, we do need to start backfilling some of those jobs. So for the next several weeks, you're collecting data from the different administrators within the city, and then what, you present it to council at that point? Well, we have a, uh, an estimated budget that is submitted uh, in early December. It's called the Mayor's Estimate, and that will be reviewed uh, by the finance uh, uh, a committee in January. We generally start that review about the last week of, of January. There's a uh, public hearing held uh, during that meeting. Uh, generally, uh, most members of council will attend uh, those meetings, or at least uh, one of them. Uh, and we usually go about two or three days. Um, we've had a pretty uh, uh, quick review. I mean, it's been thorough, but there haven't been a lot of uh, hiccups or problems because we've had a balanced budget. You know, we're, we're, we, uh, we really don't have any fights over who's going to get laid off because we're not laying anybody off. And uh, uh, we've been taking care of our, of our manpower uh, reductions uh, through attrition and, and long-term planning, basically. We look, uh, we're always looking two or three years ahead and as I, I call it flexible budgeting. Uh, it's not sufficient to just head up a budget in October and then in October of 2012 and then look at it, at, you know, and you're stuck with it until January of 2014. You, you can't manage that way effectively. You have to be able to adjust that as you go along. And th that's the reason we're, we do these mid-year reviews, and it's more than just a mid-year review to see if, you know, how we're going to hit that number at the end of the year. We'll adjust that number at the end of the year if, if we have to, and adjust our plans. When do you expect the budget to actually be approved? Well, after the hearings in, in January, the, it's normally approved the first or second week of February, or at least it has been. Mm -hmm. there, there have been years in the distant past where it's went until, I guess, uh, mid-March, and they had weeks and weeks of, of hearings. But uh, that's, that hasn't been the case. They've really streamlined the process over the last few years? Well, it's just that we haven't had the issues. Back then, it was, uh, there were serious difficulties. I mean, the this, this city was on the verge of uh, running out of money. So, I mean, I'm, those were serious times. But we brought the city's uh, financial health back. Actually, I think we're probably the, the strongest local government uh, in a financial sense in this region. Well, that's great news, and I'm glad to see the revenue increasing for 2013, and hopefully that means the economy is on the verge of improving. Steve, I appreciate you coming in today, and we'll look forward to the budget submission in the beginning of December. Thank you, Ann. You're welcome. Steve Cleves, Lima's Finance Director. I'm Ann Decker, and this is Community Focus on GTV2.